It's a distinct pleasure for me to introduce Tom Stegman, who is a uh, important member of the STM faculty. He's associate professor of New Testament and chair of the ecclesiastical faculty at, at the school across the street, the STM. He claims that his uh, early love of scripture came from his mother reading Bible stories. Is that right? Are you going to tell us your favorite ones tonight? That's something. Perhaps. Perhaps. Okay, for good. As he grew older, he was struck by how important the Bible was to his non-Catholic Christian friends, and he wanted to learn more. And he did. And in a sense, he's never stopped. He is a graduate of St. Charles Borromeo Seminary in Philadelphia, holds an MA from Marquette University, and a, both an MDiv, a Master of Divinity, and an STL, a license from the Western School of Theology. At Emory University, where he did his doctorate, he worked under the great New Testament scholar, Luke Timothy Johnson. Tom is the recipient of many academic awards, including the American Bible Society Scholarly Achievement Award and the Aquinas Institute Fellowship at Emory University. He's also held a number of visiting endowed chairs. He has published widely, uh, I have a long list of things which I'm not going to offer to you, but he's published two important books on 2 Corinthians, including a volume in the Catholic Commentary on S Sacred Scripture series. In addition, he is the co-editor of biblical essays in, in honor of Dan Harrington and Richard Clifford, and it is entitled Opportunity of No Little Instruction. In addition to his professional writing, he's, he is, excuse me, in, in addition to his books, he has also uh, published journals in the Catholic Biblical Quarterly, Novum Testamentum, and Theological Studies. He's also written more popular articles, and he is a c frequent contributor to the Pastoral Review. Tom recently finished writing a commentary on St. Paul's letter to the Romans, which will appear in the Paulist Biblical Commentary of which he is one of the six co-editors. So as you can see, Tom is the student and fan of many sacred figures. Among the sacred figures that he reveres are the Green Bay Packers and the St. Louis Cardinals. We will try not to hold that against him tonight here in Boston. Writing for a Midwestern Jesuit newsletter, he said this, as I think about my life, I marvel at the journey on which God has led me from a small town in south central Nebraska to teaching Jesuits, other religious, and lay students who come from all the parts of the world preparing for various forms of ministry in the church. What I try to inculcate most in my students is a love and reverence for God's word in scripture, which leads to a love and reverence for Jesus. Please join me in welcoming Tom Stegman. First, some words of thanks. Uh, thanks to you for coming out on such a dreary day. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to see such a nice crowd here tonight. Secondly, a uh, thank you to the uh, Kitts family whose generosity makes this lecture possible. And third, I'd like to say a, a thank you to uh, Dick Clifford, in whose honor this lecture is. Uh, Dick was my teacher back in the uh, early 90s, uh, was the uh, co-director of my STL thesis. Um, when I was finishing my doctoral studies, Dick was one of the people who recruited me to teach at Weston. That might call into question some of his judgment. Um, and uh, I had the pleasure of actually teaching with Dick, and it was a great experience. Uh, Dick was also my dean. Uh, we're both co-editors of this Paulus Biblical Commentary, so we work together at that level. Uh, but most importantly, Dick is a brother, Jesuit, and a dear friend, and uh, I just want to thank you for all the things you've done for me, Dick. The Gospel of Mark is challenging and enigmatic in many ways. Mark depicts Jesus as the mystery of the kingdom of God, as a mighty healer and exorcist who warns the people, the healed and the witnesses alike, not to tell others of his power, and as a Messiah who must suffer and die. The Mark in Jesus calls his disciples to carry their cross and to strive for greatness by becoming slaves. Mark frequently portrays the disciples as failing to comprehend Jesus and heed his teaching. In fact, the original ending of this gospel 
as the women who encounter the empty tomb running away and saying nothing to anyone, for they were greatly afraid. Challenging and enigmatic indeed. These features, among others, demand that Mark's gospel be studied with great care. Even more as a privileged expression of God's word, they invite prayerful encounter with the text. Such prayerful encounter will be greatly rewarded. We will see that in the first place, Mark presents Jesus as a model prayer, one who prays, as one whose fidelity to prayer allows him to discern God's will and gives him the wherewithal to carry it out. Focus on Jesus as prayer will constitute the first half of this lecture. The second half, then, will look at the prayer of Jesus' followers. A unique aspect of Mark's portrayal of discipleship is his emphasis on the necessity of being with Jesus. For present-day disciples, being with is made possible by prayer. Mark highlights the necessity of listening to Jesus, especially as he journeys towards Jerusalem, wherein he reveals the essence of discipleship. And as we'll see, the type of listening called forth here leads to obedience. And Mark also suggests that the community of Jesus' followers are, in effect, a new temple, a house of prayer open to all, characterized by robust faith and mutual forgiveness. An underappreciated facet of Mark's gospel is his his depiction of Jesus as prayer, as one who prays. To be sure, Mark does not list as many instances of Jesus at prayer as, for example, Luke does. But nevertheless, Mark's placement of such occurrences at critical points in the narrative, within the prologue, in his description of a representative day in Jesus' ministry, at a significant moment near the midpoint of the gospel, at the beginning of Jesus' passion, and in the moments before his death, attest to their importance more than the quantity of instances might at first glance indicate. As we will discover, Mark suggests that Jesus' fidelity to prayer helps him to discern God's will and strengthens him to enact it. Just as the infancy narratives in Matthew and Luke and the prologue in John set forth each evangelist's particular understanding of Jesus, so do Mark's introductory verses. Mark's prologue has details that intimate the importance of Jesus' prayer. His account of what happens immediately following Jesus' baptism, the rending of the heavens, the descent of the spirit like a dove, and the divine voice is unique in one important respect. While the other evangelists convey the public character of at least some of these phenomena, Mark implies that Jesus alone saw the vision and heard the heavenly voice. His version therefore homes in on Jesus' private experience of God's communication to him. To be sure, Mark does not explicitly declare that Jesus was praying at his baptism, but the emphasis on the private, intimate quality of the experience suggests a context of prayer. The two elements of God's declaration to Jesus, you are my beloved son, and you I have taken delight, are also worth noting. First, God's calling Jesus beloved son evokes the story of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22, where Abraham is directed to sacrifice his only son. Three times there, he refers to Isaac as beloved son. And thus, at the outset of the gospel, Mark already foreshadows the cross, the sacrifice of God's son. Second, the phrase, in you I have taken delight, is an allusion to Isaiah 42, a passage in which God's servant is anointed with the Spirit and commissioned to bring forth justice. Evocation of the Isaiah servant also points to Jesus' suffering. Following Jesus' baptism, the Spirit of God leads him into the wilderness. In the biblical world, the wilderness, eremos in Greek, is a place of privileged encounter with God. It is also a place of testing. Indeed, Mark indicates that Jesus was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He then immediately declares that Jesus was with the wild beasts. Though commentators differ on their interpretation of the presence of wild beasts, it is best understood as pointing to the restoration of creation's original harmony, 
think in terms of uh, Isaiah's uh, portrayal of the wolf and the lamb lying next to one another. That is, Mark portrays Jesus as the new Adam, who by his obedience to God in the face of testing, reverses the deleterious effects of the first Adam's disobedience. Unlike Adam, who failed when tempted by the serpent, Jesus was steadfastly faithful to God when tempted by Satan. And unlike Adam, who after succumbing to temptation, shrank away from God's presence, Jesus remained in the divine presence as obedient son. Now pulling together the various elements, including the biblical allusions from the Mark and Prologue, the following themes emerge. Jesus is depicted as having an intimate encounter with God the Father. He is empowered by the Spirit and given a mission by God, one that will involve suffering and death. And he remains faithful to God in the face of testing. Now, just as the overture of a symphony sounds forth notes and motifs to be developed, so Mark is setting the stage for later elaboration of these themes. And in doing so, he will make explicit that Jesus' prayer is the linchpin that holds them together. Mark's first explicit statement that Jesus withdrew for solitary prayer appears near the end of chapter 1. He says, And early in the morning, when it was still dark, Jesus arose and left the house, and he went away to a wilderness place, and there he was praying. Jesus' early morning prayer brings to completion a 24-hour period of ministry in Capernaum. On the previous day, Jesus taught in the synagogue and cast out a demon. And upon leaving the synagogue, he healed P Peter's mother-in-law. And after sunset, it was a Sabbath, he cured many who were sick and cast out several demons. Many commentators correctly note that Mark's description of Jesus' activity in chapter 1 is intended to convey a typical day of, in his ministry. Fewer scholars, however, rightly point out that Mark's report of Jesus at prayer is also meant to be regarded as his typical practice. The locus of Jesus' prayer is Eremas Tapas, literally wilderness place. This phrase is puzzled exegetes, many of whom observe that the area surrounding Capernaum is cultivated. Mark's reference to Eremus, however, points the reader back to the conclusion of the prologue. As we have just seen, the wilderness is a place of encounter with God, as well as of testing. Just as Jesus was depicted in the opening verses as steadfast in obeying God, even in the face of being tested, so is the case in the present passage. So what is the nature of Jesus' test in this instance? A hint is given by the verb katadioko in verse 36. Simon and the other disciples pursued or tracked down Jesus. This verb has hostile and negative connotations. It's the verb that the Septuagint uses to describe pharaohs pursuing the Israelites when they were fleeing from Egypt. That the disciples are in pursuit of Jesus, having their own agenda, rather than following him as they were called to do, is an indicator that something is amiss. Upon finding Jesus, they comment, everyone is looking for you. The implication seems to be that, given the success of Jesus' ministry the previous day, he should return to Capernaum in order to continue it there. But as the following verses make clear, Jesus regards their idea, inspired by the flesh of success and the people's acclamation, as an instance of thinking not from God's perspective, but rather from a human point of view. Jesus then reveals in verse 38 the knowledge and resolve that result from his encounter with God in prayer. He declares, let us go elsewhere into the neighboring towns in order that I might preach there as well. Following the, rest, the arrest of John the Baptist, Jesus entered Galilee and began to his ministry of preaching the good news. In the present passage, Jesus not only confirms that his God-given mission is to preach, he also insists that God is now calling him to proclaim the good news beyond Capernaum. The allure of success and popularity do not hold Jesus back from responding positively to the will of his Father. And Jesus' final comment, for this reason I have come out, can and I think should be read at two different levels. 
At the level of the story, it reinforces Jesus' determination to come out, that is, to leave at Capernaum in order to proclaim the good news elsewhere. At the level of theology, Jesus' words indicate that he has come forth from God, both to announce and to inaugurate the coming of the kingdom. Jesus' prayer brings him knowledge of God's will and the commitment to obey it, both in terms of a particular situation early in his ministry as well as in terms of his overall mission. The image of Jesus' typical practice of prayer should be kept in mind as we work our way through Mark's gospel, including his account of Jesus' Galilean mission in chapters 1 through 6. In other words, we are to understand that Jesus' ministry of teaching, casting out demons, and healing manifests his prayer-grounded obedience to God. These are the very activities by which he proclaims the gospel of God and inaugurates God's kingdom. With this in mind, we arrive at a crucial juncture in Mark's gospel, where Jesus invites his disciples to come away with him to a wilderness place, and where, following the feeding of 5,000 men, not to mention the women and children who were there, he went away to a mountain in order to pray. What is the significance of Mark's second explicit notice of Jesus at prayer? That Jesus decides to retreat to a wilderness place, mentioned two times in verses 31 and 32, is an important clue. This is the same phrase Mark used in chapter 1, which in turn evokes his reference to Eremos in the prologue. Now, while many commentators struggle to make sense of Mark's geographical markers throughout chapter 6, it is more productive to focus on the symbolic significance of wilderness place, that is, as a place of encounter with God, as well as of testing. Jesus' encounter with God in prayer, however, is not recounted until the end of the day, in verse 46. But in the meantime, the immediately preceding context suggests how Jesus is tested here. In Mark's telling, Jesus' withdrawal into the wilderness is catalyzed by the unjust and brutal murder of John the Baptist. John was the divinely appointed forerunner of Jesus, who announced his coming and prepared for it by calling people to repent. It was John's faithfulness to his vocation that led to his death. His challenge to Herod to repent, to repent of his unlawful marriage, provoked the ire of Herodias, who took advantage of Herod's shameful promises at his birthday party to have the Baptist beheaded. This sequence of events in which John's God-given mission ultimately led to his being put to a violent death likely triggered in Jesus a realization in question. Was his God-given mission to announce and inaugurate the kingdom of God leading to a similar violent ending? That John's death functions as a pivotal moment in Jesus' discernment of God's will is confirmed by chapter 9, verses 12 and 13. Immediately following Jesus' transfiguration, a scene that anticipates his resurrection and glorification following his suffering and death, Jesus interprets John's death as prefiguring his own fate. Moreover, both deaths are linked to God's mysterious plan for salvation. Of course, John's death is not the first suggestion that Jesus' mission will culminate in his death. Recall the allusion to the story of the sacrifice of Isaac, the beloved son. In addition, Mark has inserted several passion pointers in the text up to this point, such as the plot by the Pharisees and the Herodians to destroy Jesus in chapter 3. Even the feeding of the multitudes with the five loaves foreshadows Jesus' later description as one who came not to be served, but to serve, and to offer his life as a ransom for many. Though seeking quiet and rest with his disciples, Jesus responded with compassion to the needs of the assembled crowds. It is hardly accidental that Mark employs Eucharistic language, taking, blessing, breaking, and giving to describe Jesus feeding the crowds. These contextual markers are essential for interpreting Mark's notice in verse 46 that Jesus, after dismissing the disciples and then the multitudes, went up on the mountain to pray. Now, just as the phrase wilderness place has symbolic resonances for Mark, so too does the mountain. 
It is the locus of special encounter with God. Think of Moses in Exodus 19 or Elijah in 1 Kings 19. While Mark does not relay the content of Jesus' prayer in this instance, the latter's subsequent words and actions make clear that he understands that he must go to Jerusalem where he will suffer and die. And Jesus' resolute journey to the holy city also manifests his obedience to God. Such knowledge and commitment, I suggest, are the fruit of his sustained prayer on the mountain. We're told that he prayed to the fourth watch till three in the morning, as well as of his ongoing prayer. The next explicit notice of Jesus at prayer in Mark's gospel is the poignant scene in Gethsemane on the night before his death. Jesus ascends another mount to pray, now the Mount of Olives. In contrast to his imperturbable resolve during the journey to Jerusalem and in the preceding days, Mark now portrays Jesus' fear, distress, as the hour draws near. Indeed, Jesus confides to his inner circle of disciples, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Most commentators rightly see here an allusion to Psalms 42 and 43. These were originally a single psalm, and more specifically, an instance of an individual lament psalm. Such psalms express the quandary, the fear, the sense of abandonment felt by the one who is suffering. But just as important, they also give voice to the sufferer's faith and trust in God to deliver from affliction. Moreover, some lament psalms even relate the sufferer's thanksgiving to God in anticipation of his answering the prayer for deliverance. These characteristics of lament psalms will assist in interpreting not only Jesus' words and actions in Gethsemane, but also the final words he will utter on the cross. Jesus' posture during his prayer at Gethsemane draws attention. I was happy to find this image. Because Mark dramatically describes Jesus as falling prostrate on the ground. Lying down on his face is an expression of both Jesus' reverent submission before God's presence and his desperate plea for help. The latter point raises a crucial question. Does Jesus experience God's presence and receive divine assistance during this prayer? Because a direct answer is not given, it will be necessary to press some details in the text. Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane divides into four parts. First, he addresses God as Abba, Father. And Mark is the only evangelist who records the Aramaic term. With this form of address, Jesus expresses his filial intimacy and love for the one who has named him beloved son. Second, Jesus renders to God reverence and praise by saying, all things are possible to you. Rather than express some abstract theological principle concerning divine omnipotence, Jesus' confession of God's power reflects his conviction, born from experience, that God holds and sustains his life, and indeed all life, in God's hands. And used in conjunction with his address to God as Abba, Jesus' confession of God's power is shot through with obedient trusting. Third, Jesus offers a prayer petition that God remove the cup of suffering from him. At first glance, this request seems to call into question Jesus' willingness to submit obediently to the divine will. How is this to be reconciled with the preceding analysis that insists on the importance of prayer for him in determining and then acting on God's will? To be sure, Mark does not flinch at portraying the pathos of the situation. Jesus hesitates and expresses his horror in the face of the gruesome suffering of crucifixion. Yet his intimate relationship with God allows him to express himself with complete honesty and transparency. Jesus' petition should also be understood in light of what was said above about the lament psalms. That is to say, just as his statement to the disciples that his soul is deeply grieved evoked the plight, terror, and feeling of isolation of the innocent sufferer of the psalms, so now his plea echoes the psalmist's cry for deliverance. And not to be lost sight of is that in the first two parts of his prayer, Jesus has already demonstrated his trust in God, another feature of lament psalms. Fourth, and here we arrive at the climax of Jesus' supplication, he prays, but 
I ask for not what I want, but instead what you want. These final words of Jesus' prayer override the previous petition. Despite his understandable hesitation and fear in the face of suffering, Jesus now commits himself to carry out wholeheartedly the divine will. And in doing so, his prayer in Gethsemane taps the deepest current in Jesus' life as presented by Mark. It is cut from the same cloth as the prayers in chapters 1 and 6, wherein Jesus emerged with resolve to enact God's will for him. Now, similar to Isaac, the beloved son, he obediently entrusts his life and future into the hands of the one he lovingly calls Abba. Is Jesus' determination the result of experiencing God's presence and aid? The passage ends with the notice that Jesus returns to his disciples and declares, let us go. Behold, the betrayer is, has drawn near. Jesus' posture and demeanor are markedly transformed from lying prostrate in desperation to resolutely taking charge. Moreover, the phrase, let us go, renders the term agomen, the very same word Jesus employed when rising from prayer in chapter 1 as he declared his commitment to heed God's call to him to proclaim the gospel to the neighboring towns. In these ways, Mark signals that Jesus did gain strength from his prayer and that he did encounter the divine presence in Sukkur in Gethsemane. Although the evangelist records no words from God here, his narrative strongly suggests that the Father was neither silent, absent nor silent. Following his arrest in the garden, Jesus says very little in Mark's gospel. His final words are uttered after he endured the agony of the crucifixion for six hours. Jesus prays the opening line of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To be sure, these words convey Jesus' heart-wrenching pain and feelings of discouragement as he hung on the cross. But his cry ought not to be reduced to expressing only despair. Psalm 22 is another song of lament. This particular psalm alternates between cries of complaint and expressions of hope and trust in God. Moreover, it culminates with an extended thanksgiving to God for deliverance. That Mark intends Jesus is praying the entire psalm and that the original audience would have interpreted him thus is strongly suggested by the evangelist's allusions, allusions to various parts of Psalm 22 throughout the narrative. Thus, as was the case with the prayer in Gethsemane, the key to understanding Jesus' prayer on the cross is the movement, one might say the theology, of the lament psalm. While Mark retains Jesus' sense of terror and pain, nevertheless, he also implies that Jesus' prayer expresses trust in God to vindicate his faithfulness in carrying out the divine will. And Mark's narrative goes on to indicate that God did, indeed, respond to Jesus' self-offering. Immediately following Jesus' death, Mark reports that the curtain of the temple was rent apart. God's mercy and forgiveness of sins are now mediated through the cross, through Jesus' self-offering in love, in obedience to God. Furthermore, as the women went to the tomb on the third day, Mark relates that the large stone that sealed Jesus' tomb was rolled back, which is then followed by the heavenly messenger's announcement that Jesus has been raised. In all instances, Mark employs passive voice verbs, was rent apart, was rolled back, has been raised, all of which indicate God's agency. This is known as the divine passive. God has vindicated Jesus' obedient self-offering by raising him from the dead to the fullness of life over which death has no more power. Indeed, the resurrection of Jesus, God's beloved Son, gives texture and definition to the eschatological deliverance portrayed at the end of Psalm 22. So bringing this first half to a close, Mark thereby presents Jesus as the new Adam, through whose obedience unto death, God has brought about a new creation, life in the spirit that will culminate in the resurrection from the dead of which Jesus is the first fruits. At pivotal points in his narrative, Mark has shown that it is through fidelity to prayer that Jesus comes to know God's will and receives the strength to enact it. 
But Jesus' prayer is only one side of the coin of Mark's teaching about prayer. The other side is the importance of prayer for Jesus' followers. What are the implications for the prayer life of the community, both Mark's original community and believers today, that exists in this new creation? In addition to presenting him as the model prayer, one who prays, Mark reveals that the risen Jesus, along with God the Father, is the one to whom our prayer is to be directed. A key to appreciating how Jesus' followers are called to pray is found in four texts that bear uh, special Mark and emphases. Mark's portrait of prayer functions at the level of the Gospels narrative to show how Jesus discerned God's will and was empowered to obey it. But at another level, at what might be called the exhortative or the paranetic level, the evangelist holds Jesus up as a model prayer for us to emulate. This paradigmatic aspect of Jesus' prayer is essential for Mark because of the way he sets forth what constitutes the heart of discipleship, namely seeking and doing God's will. Jesus makes this clear when he's approached by members of his family who think he's out of his mind because of his frenetic ministerial activity. And he responds, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus thereby introduces the image of family to describe the community of, of his followers. Mark's gospel suggests a fourfold logical sequence in connection with these points. First, the distinctive characteristic of the family of faith gathered around Jesus is the commitment to do God's will. Second, prayer is the chief way by which we discern the divine will and are empowered to obey it. Third, Prayer of this type is exemplified by Jesus, God's beloved Son. And fourth, we thus express our filial relationship with God, the Father, and our solidarity with Jesus by imitating his prayer. While Mark's gospel expresses solidarity between Jesus and his followers, he also sets forth Jesus' exalted status vis-a-vis -vis the family of faith. For instance, in the prologue, where any sounds notes to be amplified later in the text, Mark ascribes to Jesus the divine titles Lord and Mighty One. In addition, John is, or Jesus is described by John the Baptist as having the power to dispense the gift of God's Spirit. As the Son of Man, Jesus pronounces the forgiveness of sins, exercises authority over the Sabbath, and will participate in the future and final judgment, all of which are divine prerogatives. Moreover, Mark dramatically narrates Jesus' power to quell the destructive forces of a storm at sea, to defeat a legion of demons, to heal an untreatable illness, and most spectacularly of all, to reverse the power of death itself in raising up Jairus' daughter. No wonder that figures like the garrison demoniac, the hemorrhaging woman, and Jairus fall at Jesus' feet and worship him. Mark thereby presents a paradox in terms of the prayer life of the new family gathered around Jesus. On the one hand, he holds up Jesus, the prayer, the one who in prayer addresses God as Abba, as a model for us to imitate. On the other hand, he intimates that Jesus, especially in light of his resurrection and exaltation, is now worthy to receive our prayer. That is, the risen and exalted Jesus, along with God the Father, is to be addressed in prayer both by individuals and by the gathered community. Now, in order to work through Mark's paradox, let's look briefly at four passages, which, comp when compared to parallel texts in Matthew and Luke, highlight Mark and themes that are often underappreciated by commentators. The first text is found in chapter 3, Jesus calling the 12 and empowering them for ministry. Luke's account, which is on the right-hand side of the slide, Luke's account of this event is streamlined. Jesus simply chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. Matthew's telling puts the accent on Jesus bestowing on the 12 the power to cast out demons and heal infirmities. Mark's version has Jesus appointing the 12, quote, in order that they might be with him and in order to be sent to preach and to have authority to cast out demons, end quote. 
Notice that prior to the sending the 12 on mission, Mark highlights the notion of being with Jesus. For him, being with Jesus is the primary task of those called by him. It is the sine qua non of faithful discipleship. Not only does Mark's syntax in chapter 3 suggest this emphasis on being with Jesus, it's also indicated by the arrangement of the ensuing narrative. That is, the 12 are not actually sent on mission until chapter 6. In the meantime, they are privy to listening to Jesus teach about the kingdom of God in parables in chapter 4 and to watching him in his ministry in chapter 5. Being with Jesus, therefore, entails learning from his words and his deeds about how to be faithful proclaimers, healers, and agents of God's liberating mercy. While being with Jesus might seem to be the special privilege of the 12 who enjoy Jesus' physical presence, Mark offers hints of a wider call and a broader mode of access. In terms of a wider call, Mark does not emphasize, especially in comparison with Luke, the special role of the apostles. In his gospel, the line separating the 12 from a larger group of disciples is fluid and often blurred. Hence, being with Jesus is an essential trait of all his followers, and not just the prerogative of the 12. But granted, this observation is not being with Jesus in order to listen to him and observe him in action, isn't that still limited to the characters of the gospel, to the disciples who actually accompanied him? The second key text from chapter 6, Jesus' invitation to the 12 to come by themselves to a wilderness place, is where Mark suggests a broader mode of access to Jesus. The context of this passage is, Jesus, is the 12's return from their missionary work that was marked by hectic activity. Looking at the parallel texts once again sheds light on what Mark is up to. In Luke, Jesus and the apostles withdraw to a city, while in Matthew, only Jesus withdraws to a wilderness place. The disciples come onto the scene a few verses later, but after the crowds have found Jesus. What is unique about Mark's account is that Jesus directly invites his followers to accompany him into the wilderness. Now, as we noted earlier, the wilderness is a place of encounter with the divine. I suggest that chapter 6 functions as a perennial invitation by Jesus to his followers, including those of us in the present day to take time out from the often chaotic busyness of our lives to be with him in prayer. That is, the passage calls us to come to a place of sacred encounter, one that sets us in the presence of the risen Lord. Indeed, it's with good reason that many retreat directors assign this text to their directees at the beginning of a retreat. Now, one reason why being with Jesus in prayer is crucially important is suggested by the third key passage in chapter 4, where Jesus answers the question posed to him by the disciples about why he speaks in parables. Again, comparison with Luke and Matthew illuminates a particular Markan emphasis. In Luke and Matthew, Jesus tells the disciples, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Both Luke and Matthew emphasize the disciples' knowledge and the object of their knowledge, namely the mysteries or secrets, notice the plural, of the kingdom of God. In Mark's telling, the focus is different. To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. Observe that there's no reference to the disciples being bestowed with a particular knowledge, but even more significant is that Mark stresses they have been given the mystery, singular, of God's kingdom. So what is the mystery of God's kingdom? Well, that is the natural question to ask. It turns out to be on the wrong track. The better question is, who is the mystery of God's kingdom? The mystery of God's kingdom is Jesus himself, the Holy One of God. As noted in my introductory remarks, Mark's portrait of Jesus is both difficult and enigmatic. Throughout the narrative, only God and the demons fully recognize who he is. 
It is challenging enough that Jesus manifests the power of God in ways that evoke wonder and awe. But as we'll see momentarily, it's on Jesus' journey to Jerusalem that the mysterious quality of his revelation is most evident. Another way to express that for Mark, Jesus is the mystery of God's kingdom is to refer to him as the parable of God. This is a, a great uh, equation uh, put together by John Donahue, a friend of Dick's and mine. Just as parables with their open-ended nature elude exhaustive comprehension, so it is with Jesus. And such is to be expected of one who reveals the mysterious power and love of God. It is thus necessary for us to constantly heed Jesus' invitation to come away with him to a wilderness place, to be with him in prayer, allowing Jesus to fully reveal himself and teach the depths of what is entailed in discipleship is a lifelong task. It is also a necessary task if we are to discern God's will in our lives. The family of faith, those whom Jesus calls his brothers and sisters, must draw close to him. Intimacy with the risen Jesus is the sine qua non for discerning and enacting God's will. Now, How does the prayerful encounter with the risen Jesus being with him take place for contemporary disciples, take place for us. The original ending of Mark's gospel, uh, the fourth key passage, suggests one privileged way this can happen. When the women came to Jesus' tomb to anoint the body, they find the stone covering the tomb already rolled back. Instead of a corpse, they encounter a mysterious figure, dressed in white, who reveals to them that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Moreover, they are instructed to inform the male disciples that Jesus has gone before them into Galilee. It is there in Galilee that they will encounter him. We who, are, who read Mark's gospel today are likewise invited to the encounter in Galilee, but now in the Galilee of the gospel text. That is, we can be with the risen Jesus by returning again and again to a prayerful, meditative reading of this gospel. As individuals, and even more as community gathered in prayer, we can listen, or we can read and listen to this text with eyes of faith and discerning hearts. The theme of listening emerges in the climactic moment of Mark's account of Jesus' transfiguration. From the overshadowing cloud thunders the voice of the Heavenly Father to the frightened disciples, this is my beloved son, listen to him. The context of the command to listen to Jesus is crucially important to note. It is set near the beginning of the way section, those middle chapters in Mark's gospel, in which Jesus journeys with his disciples to Jerusalem. This section is structured around three passion predictions in which Jesus, the Messiah and Son of God, reveals that he must suffer and die and be raised. Immediately following each passion prediction is a misunderstanding by the disciples, which affords Jesus the opportunity to teach about the implications of following such a Messiah. The exhortation to listen to him thus gets to the heart of what it means for us, the family of faith, to follow the one who himself has discerned in prayer God's will. Immediately following the first passion prediction, Peter rebukes Jesus, apparently because Peter is not receptive to the notion of a suffering Messiah. Jesus then instructs his disciples as follows. If any want to follow me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever would save their life will lose it, and whoever would lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. The essence of discipleship is challenging, to be sure. Self-denial, which is not to be equated with the negation of one's being, calls for growth in one's desire and ability to place the needs of others on a par with one's own or even before one's own. It demands the type of sacrifice involved in truly loving others, the commitment to seek always what is best for them. Taking up the cross language that would have had a particularly chilling effect for Mark's original hearers, 
entails the willingness to endure the suffering involved in self-denial and in the opposition and scorn that such willingness can evoke from the wider culture. After Jesus' second passion prediction, Mark recounts that the disciples were arguing among themselves about who was the greatest. This leads Jesus to teach as follows. If any wish to be first, let them become last of all and servant of all. Jesus completely reverses the prevailing standards of what constitutes greatness, both then and now. Jesus does not discourage his followers from striving to be great, but he dramatically redefines greatness as service, as taking on the mantle and demeanor of those whose role is to serve the needs of others. Moreover, Jesus embraces a child and informs his followers that such ones, the most vulnerable and least in society, have a particular claim on their loving service. In Mark's world, where children were regarded as tantamount to property, this symbolic gesture had all the more punch. It's not enough to be humble. True greatness calls for serving the humble. And between the second and third passion predictions, Mark narrates Jesus' response to a question concerning divorce and then the poignant story of a rich man who could not heed Jesus' call to sell his possessions and follow him. By setting these passages within the context of Jesus' teachings about following him as the suffering Messiah, Mark makes clear that these instructions are to be enacted within the nitty-gritty, day-to-day reality of our lives. Self-denial and loving service are to be practiced vis-a-vis our most significant relationships and the administration of our possessions. Fidelity to relationships and generosity with what God has given us are ways to put the principles of discipleship into concrete practice. Jesus' third passion prediction is followed by James and John's request for special status when he comes into his glory. Jesus reminds them that the path to glory goes through suffering and that his way of exercising authority and power is through servant love. Jesus, who recalls the mystery of God's kingdom, then summarizes his self-presentation as suffering Messiah and his teaching about discipleship in the way section by proclaiming, for indeed the Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as ransom for many. Jesus has gone before us in the way of self-giving love, the way that reveals God's love for us. It is because Jesus has already done so that we are enabled to walk in his way. Now, returning for a moment to the notion of listening. To listen in the biblical sense of the term is distinct from hearing. Uh, A lecture this long, you may have gone into hearing mode. The words are going through, but you may have tuned out the listening. That's very understandable. If you've been listening this whole time, kudos to you. Hearing is distinct from listening, or better to say, listening is an intensive form of hearing. Earlier in the parables discourse, Jesus twice exhorts, whoever has ears to hear, let him or her listen. To listen to Jesus' words is to allow them to penetrate, to become part of our very being so as to transform us. It is no accident that in Greek, and this is what I have in the slide, And in Greek, the word obey is hupakuo, a compound form of the verb listen, akuo. Thus, to listen in the sense that God commands is to be transformed unto obedience. It is the means to doing God's will as members of the family gathered around the risen Jesus. And what makes this process possible is prayer. Indeed, with his story of the deaf mute, who is healed by Jesus, this is at the end of chapter 7, a passage that is unique to Mark. Mark offers a beautiful image of such prayer. Touching the man's ears and tongue, Jesus cries, Ephatha, be opened. This text invites us to allow the risen Jesus to reach out and open our ears and even more our hearts in order to let his challenging words permeate us to empower and encourage us to follow in his way. That such transformation is an arduous and at times slow process is suggested by the two stories that bracket the journey to Jerusalem. Both involve the healing of a blind man. 
In the first, the healing of a blind man from Bethsaida, which is another passage unique to Mark, uh, the restoration to sight is difficult. Jesus twice has to lay his hands upon the man's eyes. This account intimates that what Jesus does by teaching throughout the section is tantamount to removing the spiritual blindness from his followers' hearts, the blindness that keeps us from appreciating what kind of Messiah he is and what are the implications for us. At the end of the section, Jesus performs another healing. Bartimaeus, who responds to Jesus in faith, has his blindness cured. And tellingly, Mark notes that Bartimaeus then follows him on the way, that is, in the way of discipleship set forth throughout the way section. This can also be our response when through fidelity to prayer, we allow the risen Jesus to remove from our hearts those things that keep us from following in his way. One of the most enigmatic passages in Mark's gospel is in chapter 11. There, Jesus curses a leafy but fruitless fig tree and then performs a prophetic action in the temple. And the next day, the disciples discover that the cursed fig tree has withered to its roots, which leads Jesus to offer his most sustained teaching about prayer in this gospel. Now, most commentators agree that the account of the cursing of the fig tree and the story of the temple cleansing are intended to be mutually interpretive, though exactly how is debated. For our purposes, it's sufficient to focus on Mark's particular emphases. He has Jesus, inciting Isaiah chapter 56, insists that the temple is to be a house of prayer for all the nations. Moreover, Jesus goes on to imply that his followers are to constitute a living temple, marked by faith, prayer, and the practice of forgiveness. Jesus' invitation to join the family of faith those who are committed to doing God's will, is open to everyone. As the temple was a place of prayer that bore witness to Israel's faith in God, so the community of Jesus' disciples is to be characterized by faith and by prayer. Jesus' statement about faith moving mountains has elicited much comment. In light of what I discussed above, or a few minutes ago, I suggest that a powerful manifestation of faith tantamount to moving mountains, is walking in the way of Jesus' self-giving love, especially in the face of suffering and opposition. God's kingdom gains more foothold on earth as it is in heaven when Jesus' brothers and sisters grow in our communal witness to his way of discipleship. Just as Jesus taught that prayer is necessary for allowing God's healing power to work within us, so also is prayer the sine qua non for our moving mountains, for our being conduits of God's love. Jesus teaching that one's prayer, if expressed with a truly believing heart, will be answered, is easily subject to misunderstanding. We have all prayed for the depths of our hearts, such as for the healing of sick loved ones, but our prayers have not always been answered as we hoped. Now, unless Jesus' words are to be regarded as mere hyperbole, they ought to be interpreted in light of his own prayer in Gethsemane. Not what I ask for, Lord, Father, but instead I ask for what you want. This is the essence of prayer, aligning ourselves with God's will. It is the fruit of an unconditional openness to the ways of God, an intimate union with the one whom Jesus addressed as Abba, it requires the type of listening that leads to transformation unto obedience. Indeed, to pray with integrity the petition, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, calls forth the commitment on our part to know and enact God's will in our own lives and circumstances. Now, Mark's gospel, of course, does not include the Lord's prayer that I've been citing. However, he alludes to this prayer with his teaching about the importance of forgiving others. In the first place, Jesus reminds us that the one to whom we pray is Father. Moreover, the prayer for God's forgiveness requires us who receive divine mercy to forgive others in turn. Whereas the temple was the place where sacrifice was offered for forgiveness of sins, the cross is now the conduit of God's mercy bringing about the possibility of forgiveness of sins. 
we who receive God's mercy are to be instruments of that mercy vis-a-vis -vis others. The family of faith, the living temple of prayer open to all peoples, is the place where the forgiving character of God is to be appropriated and imitated. Jesus' teaching therefore makes clear that right relationship with God also entails right relationship with others. So let's bring this to a close. While Luke's gospel is known as the gospel of prayer, the theme of prayer is also central for Mark. He portrays Jesus as the model prayer, one whose prayer allowed him to grow in intimacy with God as Abba, as well as to discern and enact God's will. Jesus is the obedient son whose self-giving love, manifested particularly on the cross, has brought about a new creation. Prayer is the means for disciples today to be with Jesus, the mystery of the kingdom of God. Mark's gospel itself provides a privileged arena for the encounter with the risen Jesus, especially in the way section where he teaches the essence of discipleship. Prayerful listening to Jesus enables the transformation unto obedience that is the mark of the new family gathered around him. The evangelist also makes clear that the family of faith is a new temple, a place of prayer where faith is enacted in love and mutual forgiveness. Our growth in self-giving love and service is, in effect, the continuation of the story Mark sets forth. Thank you. So we now have time for some uh, questions and, or comments. Let's save the complaints to the very end, if we may. Um, and a reminder, uh, Melinda asks that if you have a question, please raise your hand so that we can give you the microphone. Uh, and you will be recorded, so keep that in mind as you ask your question. I should do that in class. <laughs> Our students ask very good questions. Right here. Ask and you shall receive. Thank you so much for an informative and substantive lecture. Primarily, I wanted to say that. You touched on a couple of things that I've always struggled with with Mark's Gospel, and I'd like your comments. The first is that tension with that messianic secret, mm -hmm. the concealing and revealing constantly with like healing and then don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, was that a metaphor by the author for us to actually enter into that struggle the same way. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, um, another thing I've always struggled with is, you, the primary, the initial ending of the gospel mm -hmm. is pretty bleak. Mm -hmm. So was Mark, was the author like less focused on the resurrection mm -hmm. and, and more like for us to struggle with the emptiness of the tomb mm -hmm. as opposed to the uh, three later gospels? Good. Yeah, both are excellent questions. Thank you. Um, so let's try the first one. Uh, Mark's gospel is interesting. It, it almost divides perfectly in half. It, it, if you did the Christology of the first half of Mark's gospel, you would describe Jesus as the great wonder worker, the one through whom all these uh, powerful uh, miracles come about, especially through exorcising demons. Um, and it's in this part of the gospel that Mark has Jesus repeatedly uh, exhort the ones who are healed and the onlookers, don't tell anyone about this, and it's, it's so mysterious. Uh, the second half of the gospel, there's very few miracles, and, and one of which is the cursing of the fig tree, which <laughs> is an odd thing. I think the sense is, the messianic secret for Mark is he cautions about jumping too quickly to conclusions about Jesus. You don't know fully who Jesus is as Messiah until you fully appreciate that he must suffer and die and be raised. I think it's a caution towards jumping too quickly to a conclusion. And that's why I think it's significant that he refers to Jesus as the mystery of God, okay? um, or the parable of God. It's not to say that we can't have comprehension, but we're never going to exhaust the mystery. And there's a humility that is called forth there. I would also say this ties into, I think, your second question, there is a sense in which the gospel, the original gospel ends um, 
at verse 8 in chapter 16 with the women running from the tomb saying nothing to no one, uh, to use the double negative from the Greek, uh, for they were afraid of Ubuntu Gar, which has struck people as an odd way to end the story. Um, I would say a couple things about that. One is the women obviously succeeded eventually, right? Because if the women didn't tell no one nothing forever, who would know, right? So the gospel presumes the good news of, of the resurrection. I think that's presumed. In other words, there's no good news without the resurrection. The cross alone, if the story ends on Good Friday, that's not good news. Okay. So Mark's telling of the story presumes the resurrection. I think because he's writing, I mean, this is debated, what's the provenance of Mark's gospel? My own sense is he's writing in Rome around the time of the destruction of the temple, so the late 60s. So think of what's going on in Rome, the persecution of Christ followers. I think Mark is writing this text not to make fun of the women and not to make fun of the male disciples, because they're the heroes. They're the known heroes, right? Two generations later, these are the folks people um, highly regard. So I think this is functioning actually as a source of encouragement. The way set forth in this gospel is not easy. And even the, the heroes had difficulties. Okay? So I think paradoxically, it's meant to encourage us. And the open-ended quality of the gospel keeps sending us back to the text because we have to keep wrestling with the mystery. Okay? That's my own take. Now, not, that's not what everyone would say, but that's my own sense of what's going on with the gospel. Now, having said all this, it's pretty obvious that Matthew and Luke, who are second edition gospel writers, right? They're using Mark as their primary source. They didn't like the open-ended ending, or they wanted to make sure that we have stories of the appearances of the risen Jesus. And indeed, Matthew, the next gospel continues, they go up to Galilee, and behold, they find the risen Jesus, interestingly, on a mountain. Right? So good. Thank you for that. Uh, there's a question over here, and then the, then the guest of honor also. Yes. I just want to say thank you for a really uh, illuminating uh, lecture and presentation. Um, I want to offer an alternative mm -hmm. um, and see what your comments are on it. I've always imagined Gethsemane differently, mm -hmm. um, and I appreciated your fourfold uh, breakdown of that, ending with uh, thy will not mine be done. Mm -hmm. But we get that three times, right, mm -hmm. in Mark's gospel. So the first time, no answer. He goes back yep. to the disciples, comes back. So three times he yep. reboots that sequence, yep. praying the same words. Yep. So my alternative is that from an otherwise vocal God, mm -hmm. from an otherwise vocal Abba, yeah. in this particular scene, Jesus receives no consolation, no answer. Mm -hmm. um, and that the obedient act mm -hmm. is his willingness to move forward despite Without the lack it. of consolation. Yeah. I'm wondering what your thoughts yeah. are on that. You have a lot of company uh, in that. Um, both the prayer in Gethsemane and the prayer on the cross. Um, it's interesting to read the commentaries. And I would say, from my reading of the commentaries, is they're, they're basically split down the middle on this. So I'm giving a, a more benevolent reading. Um, part of which I'm, I'm struck by um, the commentary that Dan Harrington wrote with John Donahue in the Sacrapagna. And as a matter of fact, I, I have the quote somewhere in the back of this. Um, if the cry, now you, you, you're talking about Gethsemane. I'll talk about Gethsemane, but it's a related point. The cry from the cross is, is a cry of dereliction, of, of, of pure despair. Um, how is this gospel? I mean, that's, that's why they, they raise that question. Um, I take it from, what, what strikes me is there's no doubt that Mark portrays Jesus as very vulnerable, very weak, um, and in real agony. In, this is a real agony. Um, the way he's described is prostrate on the ground. It's not nearly as descript in, in uh, Luke and Matthew. Um, but I'm struck by two things. One is the total change in demeanor. 
um, as a remarkable change. And I think Mark wants us to pick that up. Jesus is back in charge, calling the disciples to follow him, um, taking on the hour, as it were. But also, and you know, one has to be careful about making too much of one word, but I've always been struck by the way that passage of prayer ends the same as the first explicit notice at the end of chapter one, where Jesus emerges from prayer and says, Ago men, let us go. Um, now, does one want to build as much as I have on those textual clues? Uh, people might debate that. The fact that this is pretty evenly debated shows that the textual evidence isn't 100% clear. And truth be told, it probably says as much about the interpreter <laughs> as the text, uh, or what we bring to the text. So thank you for that question. And, and, and that's, a, I think, a salutary, uh, I don't want to say corrective, but a, you, you filled in a way of interpreting the text that, that I didn't present. Thank you for that. Thank you also for the lecture. I wondered about the question of the content of the prayer. I mean, Jesus is said to pray uh, many times, but we're not really told what he was doing, mm -hmm. what he was saying. And I wonder if there's any way of inferring the content of the prayer or the type of approach he was taking toward God, and if that would have any effect on uh, modern prayer, of uh, people who uh, look to the gospel for some hints or models of prayer. Right. Thank you for that, Dick. Um, my sense is that the, the baptism scene gives us an important clue, and, then, and, and Luke makes us explicit that Jesus is at prayer, uh, both at the baptism and at the transfiguration. And in, in Luke's gospel, um, and in both instances, Jesus hears himself named as beloved son. Now, what strikes me about the baptism scene, especially as Mark recounts it, is Jesus hasn't done anything, right? We're not told he's done anything. And I think just in terms of our own appropriation, our own thinking about prayer, I, I think that's an important thing to, to consider. Um, we who are by adoption what Jesus is by nature, we are God's children. God loves us for who we are. We're beloved sons and daughters, not for what we do. Okay. In other words, what we do comes from our uh, receiving and appropriating the gift of God's love. My own sense is what Jesus uh, models in prayer is, and he's in prayer you know, for most of the night, he's, he's in communion with God. We're not told his, his words, maybe there weren't many words. Uh, I think the mat maturation in prayer is marked by more and more by listening, by being still, um, allowing the presence in that, of God to well up within us. So if I, had to, if I had to guess, that's what it would be. Now, certainly Jesus prayed the Psalms. We have evidence of that. And I'm sure he, he knew the Psalms very well. I'm sure he would draw upon different Psalms for different occasions. But I, I really think what this prayer is, is indicating, or the, 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 what, what Mark is, I'm suggesting, wants us to grow in is listening. Just as we listen to Jesus' words in this gospel, uh, so I think Jesus listens to his Father, calling him beloved, uh, leading him through the empowerment of the Spirit uh, to do certain things. That would be my own sense. So I think for us, the invitation is, and, and I include myself in this, I think, I mean, it's, uh, uh, vocal prayer is very important. We spill our hearts open to God. Uh, but just like in human relationships, we do better when we listen. <laughs> so it is with our relationship with God, learning to be better listeners and quiet listeners. Yes. Yes, first of all, thank you for the very enlightening lecture. Um, I, I really appreciated the section where uh, you compared and contrasted the Gospels of Mark and, with uh, Matthew and Luke. And you mentioned um, for the, I think it was the second question, that, uh, that Mark uh, is the uh, oldest of the four Gospels that we have. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask um, if Mark does predate Matthew and Luke, um, you showed that the latter are not 
um, interested in um, uh, the, uh, like the emphasis on being with Jesus and Jesus inviting disciples to the wilderness. Would you say um, that Matthew and Luke are, um, they are not concerned with that or they don't want to make the same point or they have a developing, uh, more developed theology yeah. of prayer and they, that, that is why they do not um, address those, uh, those events in the same um, mm. words. Does that yeah. make sense? Good. Uh, your, your question actually raises a methodological uh, issue in terms of when one does a synoptic comparison. So the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic Gospels. Kind of, um, everyone agrees that somebody's borrowing from somebody else. They're basically telling the same story. And the majority of scholars think that Mark is the original. Okay, but the methodological issue one uses, it's, it's easier to, to say how Luke and Mark, I'm sorry, Luke and Matthew tweak or, or differ from Mark because he's the source. Mark isn't differing from others. So I, I want to make that point, point clear. I probably should have made that clear in the text. Now, I would not want to say, I'm focusing on Mark and what's distinct about Mark. I would in no way want to say that Matthew and Luke necessarily missed the point um, they have their own emphases. And, 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 and some of what they do in editing Mark is just, uh, Mark's text is, although it's a shorter gospel, Mark tends to be wordy. His Greek is not as elegant. So a lot of what they're doing is um, shortening the text. Okay? Uh, but it is striking. And I've always been uh, impressed by that being with, which is a motif that comes up elsewhere in, in the gospel. Um, did Luke and Matthew, uh, I don't want to say they neglected it, but they certainly didn't capitalize on it. Um, but they have their own rich presentations of discipleship, and, and we're the better for having all of these. So um, and, and I think it's not an answer. You want to follow up? Yeah, um, so the question is, are Matthew's and Luke's theologies there for developments or go beyond? This is how I put it uh, in something I wrote on this, this topic. Um, you know, when I was a student, I learned that Luke was the gospel of prayer. If you want to learn about prayer, because Jesus not only uh, is at prayer at all the significant moments of his ministry, but he also teaches a prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and he teaches about prayer, the importance of prayer. So in Luke 11 and Luke 18, you have those parables, the importance of prayer. I would say that Luke makes, and by extension Matthew, but let's talk about Luke. I would say Luke makes very explicit what is, I'd say, largely implicit in Mark. And what I'm trying to do here is taking that. I mean, I'm reading between the lines. I, I'll acknowledge that, but I, I think, I would like to think my reading is justified by good exegesis. Um, but it, a lot of this is implicit. And I would say Luke makes explicit uh, what is in Mark. I feel like we've had a resurgence, at least in my area in the south region of the diocese here, of centering prayer. And can I assume, I hope I can, <laughs> that you think we're going in the right direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, a centering prayer, as I understand it, is allowing you to enter into the silence, right? Place yourself in God's presence to still yourself, uh, to hear that voice of prayer. I, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, this is going way beyond Mark's gospel, but when I think of scripture passages that are very helpful to have in mind when we think about our life of prayer. I, I love that. I mentioned Elijah in 1 Kings. And how is it that Elijah encounters God? You know, it's a story. He goes up the mountain. He's told he's going to encounter God. And, and you know, the, the wind comes and the, the fire and the earthquake, all these traditional ways in which God has manifested God's self. And we're told God was not in those things. And then... Um, the, the, the phrase is very difficult to translate. One translation has a quiet, whispering voice. I think the uh, NRSV has the sound of sheer silence. And then Elijah covers his face. 
because he knows he's in the presence of God. Um, I think that's helpful. I, God acts, I mean, the, there's figures like Paul who get knocked down, whether it's off the horse or not, uh, after Caravaggio, I think there has to be a horse. Um, that doesn't happen very often. Maybe Ignatius, St. Ignatius Loyola had us, you know, get hit by the cannonball. Very few of us have those dramatic experiences. And I think that's uh, indicative of you know, God doesn't work through force, through violence. God is always inviting. The, the spirit within us is an inviting uh, spirit who wants us and empowers us to be the best we can be. So I think centering prayer is very helpful because it helps to still a lot of those other voices <laughs> that can drown out, that are we allowed to drown out, that quiet whispering voice. So I would say you're on the right, tar right target. Maybe you can teach us here how to do that once you've got it mastered. Rick has a question. I'm just wondering if we look at Mark's gospel as the production of a community with a particular experience, is it possible that some of the depictions of Jesus' prayer reflect the liturgical mm -hmm. and uh, social fellowship and faith yeah. experience that those people involved in the production of that gospel we're experiencing, yeah. and that might account for why it's a different depiction than yeah. Matthew and Luke. It's a great question. There's a, uh, and Dick, you might help me with the name, um, a New Testament scholar, St. John's Collegeville, uh, Bobert, I can't think of his first name. He's writing, uh, I think his book might be out now. Char uh, Charles, Charles Bobert, thank you. He, he sees a lot of Eucharistic references and elements in Mark, and he goes beyond that to, towards some of the things that you're suggesting, that this is coming out of a community. Uh, to be honest, I, I, um, I, I've heard Charles give a couple papers on this, uh, the Catholic Biblical Association. The first paper I heard, I was kind of skeptical, because I thought um, it seemed he was reading the text pretty hard to make that happen. but. The more I, well, the more I've heard from him, and we've had some conversations. I told him I'm going to read his book when it comes out. I'm open to that way of understanding. I, I must say I, I don't know all of his argument yet, but I would uh, ask you to, or recommend that you look that name up and see if his book come, is out. Um, can't think of the title, but it would be pretty evident. But it's the uh, centrality of the Eucharist for understanding Mark's gospel. Eucharist, not just, not the sacrament of the Eucharist per se, but the celebration, the community celebrating Eucharist. Um, I think everyone agrees that this is coming out of some context in which the community is under duress, persecution, whether that's in Rome or it could be in other parts of the empire. Um, so I, I think you're onto something. I, I, it's, it's not what I've, my own study, I haven't gotten there yet, but um, I might have to expand my horizons on that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Um, I have a question. When you spoke of the action in the Garden of Gethsemane, yeah. and then it almost struck me that the, the Lord's Prayer then is in fact a personification or a retelling of, his whole, of that whole gospel. Mm -hmm. If we he just gave us an example of what we ought to do. Am mm -hmm. I way off on that? No, no, I think it is. I think that's the quintessence of thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I mean, that's, uh, you know, just to be clear, um, you're not suggesting this, but I just want to be clear that people understand. Mark doesn't contain the Lord's Prayer, right? Um, no, I don't, you weren't saying that. Um, but I think this is the quint. I think if you, if you take Mark 1436, which is that prayer, and combine it with, in chapter 11, verses 23 to 25, where Jesus is talking about faith in the Father and forgive those uh, others, you have Mark's version of the Lord's Prayer. And I would say Mark shows it 
being enacted, prayer being performed. And when I say performed, I'm not talking about in a, in a um, superficial way, but performative in the sense that the word is effective or that the prayer is effective and effected. Yeah, that's a good observation. Thank you. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful evening. Appreciate your time.